Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be back. Um, so today, um, we're going to talking about something not really SMS, HTML5 related, um, but it's important for everyone, um, infrastructure and just, you know, like um, the organization of your code base. Um, so my talk is called um, From Monorail to Monorepo. Um, and it's really about Airbnb's journey into microservices. Um, everyone's heard about microservices, the new hotness. Um, so how does Airbnb kind of transition from a massive repository, from a massive Ruby on Rails applications into, into microservices? Um, so who am I? Well, my name's Jens. Um, I will save you the pronunciation of my last name for later. Um, I'm, so as I mentioned before, I'm Belgian. I moved uh, to San Francisco in 2013, so it's been about five years. Uh, time goes fast. Uh, I'm a Howest alumni, and then you know I did a brief trip to San Francisco State to do my master's degree. Um, and I actually have a background as a front-end engineer. Um, I used to be a front-end engineer, and then somehow end up on an infrastructure team. Um, if you're interested in like following me on any of the relevant social media, GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, feel free to connect with me. I'll be more than happy to talk to you uh, after this presentation as well. Um, so in 2017, I ended up joining Airbnb. Um, Airbnb is now my home, and I've been with Airbnb for about uh, a year now. Um, so I'm actually on a team called uh, Deploy Infra, uh, which is completely different um, from being a front-end engineer. Um, so what does Deploy Infra do? Well, Deploy Infra is a supporting team. So at Airbnb, we have enabling teams uh, or supporting teams which basically enable product engineers um, to do what they're best at. We want to make sure product engineers are happy. Um, so Deploy Infra is part of a small subgroup at Airbnb called BTD, uh, Build, Test, Deploy. Um, and we used to be known as developer happiness. You know, my job is to make people like you happy. We want to make sure people are really happy and they, you know, they're feeling productive. They use the tools they love and like. Uh, so my, customers, my customer is basically an engineer, which is really fun because I get to make things for nerds. Uh, so that's really fun. Uh, one caveat, um, even though I'm part of a deploy infra, I don't actually deploy code at Airbnb. We merely provide the tools that enable engineers to kind of ship their code into, into production. Uh, so as you can see from kind of the pyramid chart there, um, Deploy Infra is part of a larger infrastructure team. Uh, so how does this journey into microservices start? Well, here's a little piece of history for you. Um, you're looking at Nate. Uh, Nate is one of the three founders of Airbnb, and Nate is the kind of the engineer guy. Um, and he made history here. You're looking at the very first commit to the Airbnb code, code base. Um, it's actually not Git, it's SVN. We later moved to Git. Uh, so you can see, like in 2009, uh, Nate decided it would be a good idea to make Airbnb a Ruby on Rails application. Well, we're here one decade later, and let me tell you, it's been quite a journey to get rid of this Ruby on Rails application. <laughs> um, so, you know, humble beginnings. There were just three guys trying to get by. You know, you do Rails in it in your terminal, and you know, you're good to go. But, you know, it, it has a big kind of a butterfly effect. Um, so what what is monorail, as we call it nowadays? Well, mono, one, rail, Ruby on Rails. Uh, Monorail is our internal code name for the application that Nate made back in the days. Um, and it's a very big Ruby on Rails application. Um, the front end, well, back in the early days, there was no React in 2009. Um, so re, um, they decided to do jQuery. Eventually, they moved to Backbone. Uh, there's still hundreds and hundreds of files of Backbone in there. Uh, but since 2015, you know, we've modernized. We've moved to React and Redux, so we're, you know, we're up there with the rest of the, of the Bay Area. Um, what is our backend? Well, nowadays, well, back in the days, our backend was like some, some Java services here and there, but most of the backend also lived in Monorail. Uh, we had some asynchronous jobs in there, like you know, sending an email, sending a text message. That lives in Monorail as well, and under the form of rescue jobs, rescue being a framework to kind of schedule jobs in, in Ruby on Rails. Um, so you know, up until now, how have we kind of been deploying this monorail application? Uh, well, let me tell you about the life of a pull request at Airbnb up until like 2014-ish. 
Um, so what happens is, you know, you want to make a change to this monorail application. You're just hacking on your laptop. You want to, I don't know, change the color of a button. Uh, your designer tells you you need to update the Airbnb.com front page. Well, the first thing you do is you kind of uh, go through with this process called code review. Uh, you get a bunch of like developers to look at your code and make sure everything looks good. You're not trying to sneak anything into, into production. You need to get reviewed by your peers. Uh, we have a system of code ownership at Airbnb. We have a bot that will kind of automatically tag the owner of a certain file in Monorail. Uh, Monorail being as big as it is, there's hundreds of owners, so sometimes it'll tag you with a person that's no longer at Airbnb. Uh, the joys of working in a mono repo, right? Um, and then, you know, once you're done with that, you still have to go through CI, continuous integration. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Uh, what is it? You have to go through tests. Uh, you have to go through linting rules. Uh, one of the more famous ones, Airbnb's ESLint style guide. If you haven't used it, check it out, especially for uh, front-end developers here. We have a really well-known set of rules for ESLint. Uh, so, you know, once you've gotten through CI, you know, everything's good, everything's green. The build is green, as they say. Uh, you get merged into the, into the master branch, and uh, the deploy process begins. Uh, first things first, you know, you'll be automatically deployed to Next. Next kind of being Airbnb's uh, staging environment. It's what's going to be on production next, hence the name Next. Um, internally at Airbnb, we, we just surf to next.airbnb.com, and it's a complete replica of our production environment. Um, and there, engineers can kind of manually test changes. Um, Next is also a canary environment. A uh, canary, kind of like the canary in the coal mine. If something's wrong, the canary dies. Um, it serves 3% um, of Airbnb customers. So if you've ever experienced a bug using Airbnb, you might have been looking at canary, and you might have been part of our experiment. Um, once you've been deployed to, to Next, you're going into production, um, which means you know, you're actually, you're sh your change is now live to all of Airbnb's um, of to all of Airbnb's users. Thank you. Um, and optionally, your change could still be hidden behind what we call a trebuchet. Uh, so trebuchet is our internal tour, tool uh, for kind of like launching features at people. So trebuchet is kind of uh, a medieval catapult. Uh, so internally, we have a tool called trebuchet, which you can use to launch features at your users. Um, it's basically a feature flagging system. Um, so you know, you might have been deploying a feature, but it's actually not live yet. Maybe you'll enable the trebuchet on like January 1st if it's like a special launch, or maybe you'll only roll it out to SFHTML5 visitors or something like that. So it's kind of our A-B testing slash um, feature flag system. Uh, so here's an example of our continuous integration. You can see there's a pull request on GHC, GHC being GitHub Enterprise, our internal uh, GitHub cluster. And there's all these checks that you kind of have to go through, making sure that you don't break the monorail. Um, so only once you've passed all of these checks, you can actually merge your change into master. And even then, you still have to go through a pipeline. Uh, but it, it's not enough, um, which I will talk about later. Um, so Airbnb, Airbnb has a, this unique concept. Uh, if you be working at a Google or a Facebook or something, uh, you would be hearing about release engineering. Those, those are like people that will make sure um, that your code gets deployed properly. That's their full-time job is shipping code. As I said before, deploy infra is only five people. We're not going to be there shipping your code. We have a concept called democratic deploys. Um, and as you can see from the Happy Simpsons guys, everyone's like deploying monorail uh, by themselves. Uh, so what does it mean? Every engineer at Airbnb is actually a release engineer. So we want ownership. We want every engineer at Airbnb to have the ability to deploy into production. Sounds scary. Well, we have good tools, so it's actually not too bad. Uh, fun story, on my first day at Airbnb, I shipped the change into production. Interns, they ship changes into production all the time. We ship hundreds of changes a day using democratic deploys. We want engineers to feel empowered. Um, so really, every engineer owns, tests, and ships their own change. There is no release engineering team. Uh, we also think if you are the person making a change, you are probably the best person to test that change. We don't deal with a QA team or something like that. You're really like owning your change all the way from your laptop to staging 
to production, and if you break something, then you'll be the person owning the incident and the post-mortem. Uh, that's just how life is. Um, so um, we have an internal tool called DeployBoard, and this is actually why I ended up on an infrastructure team. DeployBoard has quite a bit of UI, so as a front-end developer, I started you know, hacking the DeployBoard UI and slowly learned more about our infrastructure and kind of became a more well-rounded uh, full-stack developer. Uh, so DeployBoard is really our internal tool that we use for deploying. It's custom-built in-house, and every Airbnb engineer will be using this tool to um, help them ship their code into production. Uh, so what does it look like? Well, uh, as you can tell from my screenshot here, you're looking at uh, the master branch for Monorail. Um, you can see all the, the green. Green just means the build passes. We've run all the unit tests against your build. Everything's good. Uh, you can see the little uh, yellow N, which is next, and then the green P, which is production. So as you can see, next is about 20 builds ahead of production. Uh, so once everything's been tested on next, someone will uh, like a bot will say like, hey, I will be bumping production up to where next is. And then next, and, and so next and uh, our next cluster and our production cluster will be running the same build. Then what happens is we'll merge another batch of 20 changes in. We'll move next 20 sh changes ahead of production. And then we kind of do this cycle. We do this cycle a lot. We do this like once an hour. So we really ship like 20, 30 changes every hour. People keep merging pull requests, and you know, life is good. We ship changes really quickly. Well, life was good for a while. Um, this is what deploy board looks like when a deploy is going on. You see every little box is just a server, and you can kind of watch the process of a server. You can see one of our engineers started a build around five, and you know, she's deploying to 1,879 boxes. Uh, depending on your application, um, so you can be deploying a microservice that's only five boxes, but obviously monorail. That's about 1,800 servers um, and many more, um, uh, depending on like our traffic, that number of servers can go up or down. Um, you know, and that worked well for a while, uh, especially back in 2009, because you can see from this map, Airbnb was really small. There were a couple of listings maybe in San Francisco, across the US. Um, so really, our Rails app was scaling really well. And then, you know, 2017, Airbnb is like a worldwide brand. Every one of you has probably heard or at least, or even stayed in an Airbnb. Uh, we have like millions of listings now. Uh, we have four million homes that you can book on Airbnb, and more are coming every day. We have 65,000 cities where you can book an Airbnb, and we are in 191 countries. There's just two countries where Airbnb is not in. Uh, you cannot book a listing in North Korea and Somalia. Uh, you can actually book a listing in Antarctica if you're interested in staying in the cold. Um, and that worked well. And that, you know, we kept adding more and more listings, more and more users. And as you can see, we also kept adding more and more lines to Monorail. Uh, you know, you can kind of see in 2009, we didn't have a lot of commits to Monorail. And so, you know, these are like daily commits. Right now, in 2018, we're doing uh, 600 commits a day. There's like a small break there around the holidays where we have a company break every two weeks around the holidays. But, you know, more and more and more code is being added to Monorail every day. And it's just not really working very well. Um, so just to give you like some insight in what Monorail is like on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we have about 30,000 database columns just to support Monorail. Um, as of today, there are 932 individual engineers actively deploying to Monorail. Um, we ship about 220 changes a day, so every hour, you know, that's more than, you know, a working day is eight, eight hours, so we ship a lot of changes. And, you know, there's 6,587 Rails controllers in there. I mean, just opening Monorail on your laptop it doesn't work anymore. There's not enough memory on my laptop to run Monorail. I have to connect to a special virtual machine with 64 gigs of RAM just to develop in Monorail. It's just not working very well anymore. Um, and you know, in the early days, we were like, OK, we can, we can build tools around this. We can support Monorail. It's great. Everything's going to be OK. So some really smart people uh, were 
some really smart people, we were doing a hackathon and some really smart people were like, okay, we can ship things faster if we catch errors faster because then we'll do less rollbacks and we can keep moving forward faster. Um, so we built Scram, which is a fancy automatic rollback incident prevention tool, which is a mouthful. Um, and Scram's actually been really good. So Scram kind of uses uh, anomaly detection algorithms um, and it catches bugs on Next before they happen on production. So what does it do? It's hooked into Sentry. I'm not sure if any of you have worked with Sentry. Sentry is kind of a tool that kind of catches errors and the stack traces and sends it to our server. And so what it does is it looks at all the errors that are incoming for Canary, then kind of multiplies that as if it were uh, production, so that it's kind of the same volume. And what Scram does is it looks like, oh, is the volume of this login error about the same as the volume of the login error on production? If it's not, then it can see an anomaly and it knows, okay, a new error has been introduced. And then Scram goes like, nope, you're not allowed to deploy, I'm rolling back. And Scram's been really good. It's been so good that Airbnb doesn't need a QA team. Scram catches 91% of our errors even before developers have fully finished deploying to Next. Scram might already be rolling back because it's really good. And it's been getting better, actually. Uh, we've got some brilliant people at data science that have been adding some machine learning stuff. Um, so we can actually predict whether the deploy is going to be risky or not by looking at which files exactly it touches. Uh, so for example, if a Rails controller historically has been causing a lot of bugs, then we'll know that it's a more risky deploy. Um, so Scram has been helping us, and it's what has been keeping Airbnb alive for the last few years. Uh, here's a look at Scram. Uh, this is like our internal dashboard that we have for Scram. Uh, so as you can see, as we roll a build out, you can see the white and the gray. So the gray is like a new version rolling out. And so it looks at all the errors. Obviously, if an error has been there for years, it's not been introduced in a new version, so Scram shouldn't roll back. Uh, but obviously, if a new error pops up, then Scram will be like, okay, I'm rolling back. This is too dangerous. You cannot move forward. Uh, so Scram's been really good and it's really been helping us a lot and we're still investing in this, in this tool. Uh, but it, it still wasn't enough. Um, as you can see from the picture in the background, developers are like zombies. They're trying to merge stuff as fast as they possibly can. They're kind of rambling our gates and they're like, you know, we want stuff merged in production. We want it now. Um, but you know, we from Deploy Infra, we're like, okay, we can only handle like maybe 20, 30 an hour, that's all we can do, you're gonna have to wait. Um, so we've built what we call the most hated feature at Airbnb, merge queue. We've built an orderly queue for developers to wait in before they can merge their chains. You know, we're called developer happiness, we weren't making people happy by introducing merge queue, but it was a necessary evil. It's just what we had to do to keep the company going. Um, so, you know, before everyone's kind of scrambling, everyone's trying to get their changes into master, into production. Afterwards, you know, properly lined up and it's beautiful. Things are nice and orderly. Um, so, you know, the world was great again. We were able to live for another two years. We were able to scale. You were able to book your, you were able to book your Airbnb listings as if everything was properly working. Um, so, you know, we built Merge Queue the way it works. Merge Queue is actually pretty clever. Um, you go on GitHub, rather than hitting that merge button, we've just disabled that merge button and we say no one's ever going to merge again. You leave a comment on your pull request with a little rocket. It's like, I'm ready to go. You leave that comment, it gets picked up by a Slack bot and it tells you like, okay, you're now part of the merge queue. Um, we'll be sending you a message whenever you are in the batch of changes going out. So you can go back to coding and you can be coding your chains, and then you know a couple hours later it'll be like, okay, you're in the next batch. It's time for you to test your changes. Um, you know, it worked. People can do things instead of like kind of waiting to be in a batch of 20 and then kind of like hitting the green button. And then you know, because before this, people would wait for the button to become green, and it would only be green if there's 20 slots. So it would just be whack-a-mole. People would just be hit that button, and if they missed it, oh well, you won't be deploying today. If your manager wanted, wanted you to ship something, well, that's it. And so people were writing bots to hit the button, and so some people were always deploying everything, <laughs> and, uh, and some people were not deploying anything at all. So you know, we said like, okay, we're gonna put a queue in, it's fair, it's British, it works, it's a system. Um, you can put your things in a merge queue. 
Um, so this is MergeQ, you know, this is my colleague Joel. He says, like, looks good to me, LGTM, I leave a rocket, and there we go, ready to launch. My change goes into the merge queue. Uh, so we added an extra step to the life of a pull request. Engineers were just approving that once everything's green, you go into the merge queue rather than being merged into master right away. The beautiful thing about merge queue is it's pre-merged before you get merged. So if you need to run to the bathroom, you need to go to a meeting, you don't, you don't want to deal with work for, for the day, you're just fed up with monorail, you DQ, you come back later, it's non-destructive. Um, so while it's the most hated feature ever, I love talking about it because I've built merge queue and I still think it's kind of brilliant. Um, it works. Um, so here's kind of the life cycle of like a pull request going through that merge queue. Uh, so a pull request gets approved, you leave a little rocket, and then you know if the queue is empty, you get merged instantly. The queue is not going to be empty for monorail. Don't even dream about it. Maybe if you try to merge at 2 a.m., uh, but other than that, and Actually, that happened. People were merging at 2 a.m. because there would be no queue. Um, so the developers weren't really happy. Uh, we got a lot of angry emails working at Deploy Infra. Um, but you know, if there's a merge queue, you're getting queued into the merge queue. And then um, once you make it to the top of the merge queue, we just say, like, hey, are you still there? Because in the early version of the merge queue, people would go away from their keyboard and they get merged in five hours later holding up the entire train. Uh, so we had to build up a system kind of detecting whether they were AFK or not, kind of poking them like, hey, are you still there? Are you sure you still want to get merged? Because the queue sometimes was six to seven hours just to get your chain shipped into production. Um, it was horrible, but it worked. Uh, so this is what the merge queue kind of looks like inside of deploy board. You know, you see the next, you see like merging soon, those are the changes going out. So you can actually have a look at the entire queue from deploy board and you can see all the pull requests going out. You can click on that, you can kind of dig into what other people are working on today. Um, and you see, you know, people are, some people are ready, some people are not, and you know, you can DQ. Again, democratic deploys, you can DQ someone else's change if you wanted to, we give people all the freedom. Um, there are some fun stories about people DQing everyone in front of them, um, but that's for, that's for another time. Um, you know, and things, things kind of were okay, uh, but not for long. As you can see from some of these Slack messages, I'm not sure if they're really readable, but you know, there were bots in Slack saying, oh, um, you know, things are going wrong. And people were like, I'm so confused. And then someone was like, oh, you're bored. Uh, and people were like, what's going on? There's Scram there. It was just basically always on fire. You can see the Scram flame graph. Uh, you can see our integration tests. They were red. You can see the error rate going up. These are just pictures that you don't want to look at. This gives you PTSD if you're a developer. Things were not good. But you know, Airbnb was alive, you were able to book your things. So you know, the company was making money, but from an infrastructure point of view, things were really on fire. This is an actual view of like deploy infra. Uh, this is me <laughs> on, a, on an average work day, just trying to keep things alive. Um, so you know, this is me on an average day. You know, my heart rate went up, my blood pressure went up, I aged 15 years. But Airbnb was still okay, somehow. And uh, you can also see, we did a little poll, because you know, at Airbnb, numbers are everything. Um, so my manager is like, okay, while well, your team's called developer happiness, how happy are engineers at Airbnb? Well, you know, extremely unsatisfied and very unsatisfied were like the top ranked answers. I think one person was very satisfied, and it was like the day before he was leaving the company. <laughs> so he was like, bye. He was satisfied to be not working on Molora anymore. Um, you know, so nobody was satisfied. But you know, it was okay back then. So you know, we did the thing that nobody thought we would do. We went to the dark side. We did release management. I know, I know, I was talking about democratic deploys. We're still doing democratic deploys for everything, just not monorail. We needed these guardians, these gatekeepers, kind of like Gandalf, kind of someone saying like, those shall not pass. Someone to protect monorail, someone to help us. So we created a release management team. Um, so as you can see, the release managers, they were kind of watching the monorail. They were kind of making sure the monorail stays on tracks. On track. So, um, as of as many things at Airbnb, it was a volunteer rotation. God bless their souls for actually signing up for this. Um, and so, me and my team, we spent a quarter building some tooling into the deploy board to kind of help these people. And we were just kind of developing agile, you know, kind of seeing with them what kind of tools do you need to make sure that you can ship monorail. 
Um, and this introduced a dramatic cultural shift for Airbnb. We were really used to democratic deploys, like just coming up with our lease engineering team, like having five volunteers sitting there telling 700 developers what to do. It was not always well received, but you know, it reduced the number of incidents. Um, it kept the train going. It kept morale on track. Um, so what we had was kind of a, a kind of a mix match. Uh, we had release engineering during business hours. Uh, so during business hours, like someone would be on call, someone would be sitting there and kind of like shepherding the release process. And then after business hours, we would go back to democratic deploys and kind of using the queue because those volunteers, even though they were great people, they didn't want to be deploying Monorail at night. They need sleep too. Um, but you know, we've introduced release management. Release management was introduced last quarter. Um, and it's one of our like many efforts to keep Monorail alive. Um, you know, and the results were kind of promising. You can see from our metrics here, the merge queue uh, used to be really long, it used to go up to 40, and then this was a merge queue a couple of weeks ago. It never goes above 40 anymore. Um, and again, we asked developers like, "Hey, how are you feeling? Uh, are you are you happy at Airbnb?" And like, it was just a dramatic shift, even though people. Loved, uh, uh, they loved democratic deploys. They loved the idea of it, but it didn't work for Monorail. It just, it just didn't. Um, so people are much happier now. Um, but obviously, we've been doing some other things kind of like in the background, in the periphery, um, to kind of deal with this Monorail problem. Um, so what is our long-term vision? Just like Airbnb's long-term vision is not to focus on on just the market of you know just homes. Airbnb is kind of going into experiences now, and they're they're kind of diving in all these different businesses. Um, we also we were thinking about like what is the long-term vision going to be for our infrastructure at Airbnb. We were looking at other companies, you know, a Netflix, a Facebook, a Google. Like we talked to them, and we were like, okay, what have you learned from kind of going beyond this monorepo phase? So our long-term vision is, you know, we need to get rid of Monorail. There's just no way. Um, we need to just completely abandon Monorail. Um, so starting 2019, and that's actually really soon when you talk about a code base with 900 devs on it, we will be putting Monorail in maintenance mode. Um, what, does, what does it mean to put Monorail in maintenance mode? If you add a new PR to Monorail, the release managers will be looking and they'll be like, okay, no, you're adding a new feature. It's not happening. Go back to the drawing table. You're not adding anything to Monorail. That's it. So the only thing you can do on Monorail is kind of like maintain it. So security fixes, kind of like an operating system. We're just kind of like slowly deprecating Monorail. Um, so as all of this was going on and we were scaling the company, obviously we haven't been like sitting around. Uh, there's over 80 engineers in our infrastructure team just on working on tools and stuff. Um, so Airbnb really invested a lot in infrastructure. And um, we are moving to what's called a service-oriented architecture. And this is not something to be taken lightly. This is Airbnb's biggest technical bet ever. The future of the company depends on those engineers. Our technical infrastructure depends on those engineers. If our infrastructure doesn't work, we cannot IPO. We can't do anything. We need this to be. We need to get this right this time around. We can't have another monorail. Um, so we need to also proceed carefully. You know, Airbnb isn't going to be like, oh, we won't be releasing any new features for like two, two or three years while we like get rid of this monorail. Like the CEO isn't going to be happy with that. We need to have a plan um, so that we can still. Um, release features while migrating Monorail. And this is a multiple years effort uh, involving hundreds of engineers just working on the tools. This also requires effort of every single product engineer at Airbnb. We need to be telling them, you cannot work on this Monorail. Even if like designers, product managers tell them, like, you need to ship your change next week, no. We need to get rid of Monorail. It's for the best of the company. It's for the health of our system. So how do we do that? Well, originally we had Monorail, and that was everything. That was just Airbnb's infra If What is Airbnb's tech stack? Ruby on Rails. That was the answer. Um, so we're moving to um, an architecture where we have Hyperloop on the left side. Um, I'll be digging into this more. Uh, but Hyperloop is Airbnb's front end monorepo. Uh, monorepo, not monolith, it's a repository 
but it houses many, many, many small applications. Uh, think individual pages, individual components, kind of like microservices on the front end. Um, and then on the, on the other side, you've kind of got Treehouse. And for now, for the foreseeable future, Monorail will be kind of like everything else. It will kind of be the glue that sits between, that sits between Hyperloop and Treehouse uh, until we can completely get rid of Monorail, hopefully, and we'll just have Hyperloop and Treehouse. We'll have a back-end monorepo and a front-end monorepo, and that'll be our ar architecture for the foreseeable future. And so we can become a 21st century company and kind of iterate on that. Um, Hyperloop. So I'm sure m some of you are familiar with Hyperloop. Hyperloop is Elon Musk's idea um, to build a really fast train um, between LA and San Francisco. Well, Hyperloop is kind of like, what if we could have monorail on steroids, but better? What, what if we could have the monorail of the future? Um, so Hyperloop is Airbnb's front end monorepo. Um, so how does it work? Well, um, Airbnb is kind of one of the companies that's kind of been pioneering server-side rendering. Uh, we're really betting on that. So how does server-side rendering work? You write your JavaScript code, and it could run on the server in Node.js. We just basically have a virtual browser in Node.js, as if it were. Or it can run in an actual browser. If everyone's writing clean React code, then it can be rendered on the server or on the client. Why would you want to do that? Well, you have a shared React code base. You don't have to like learn Ruby views. I'm sure a lot of you don't like writing ERB, uh, which is Ruby's templating language. A lot of you don't like those like templating languages. Front-end developers just want to write JavaScript. They don't want to bother with Ruby. They want to learn one code base. Um, it's based on Hypernova. Uh, if you haven't heard about Hypernova, Hypernova is Airbnb's open source um, kind of engine uh, that allows you to run React.js code on the server, or it allows you to run any JavaScript code on the server. Uh, so on the server, we do Node.js. If you haven't heard of Node.js, Node.js is basically some genius people said, you know, what if we take the browser's JavaScript runtime, we decouple it from the render engine, and we just allow it, you know, as kind of a JVM or something. You can use the JavaScript runtime to talk to your operating system, or you can run JavaScript on your server. Um, so that's kind of how Airbnb is moving forward. Um, so as long as your JavaScript code doesn't do anything stupid, like touching the window object, which doesn't exist on the server, uh, you can write code that can run both on the server and the client. And we do that for code reusability, having one code base, and also performance reasons. Uh, the initial render, you do your initial render on the server, and then um, you send a fully rendered page down to the client, so the users immediately see something, which you can actually also cache in a CDN, so it's great. And then once that like initial skeleton has kind of been sent to the user, we'll download the actual React.js library, and then it'll become interactive. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Remember in the old PHP days where you did server-side rendering, and everyone moved to AngularJS, and you had client-side rendering, but it wasn't that great for SEO and things like that. Well, we get the best of both worlds. We have React on the server and on the client. And so the plan for Airbnb is to build many, many smaller Hyperloops. We have uh, page one Hyperloop, page two, page three. Uh, so every page on Airbnb will have its own Hyperloop. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the benefits of server-side rendering, uh, you'll, send the initial, uh, you'll send the initial payload down to the client, which uh, it's like a pre-rendered version of your app, and then you make an interactive by downloading the JavaScript later. Uh, so this is what Airbnb's front end looked like uh, when we were dealing with Monorail. I'm not going to dig into all of this. Um, this is a pretty low-level overview. But look at the orange part. Uh, the orange part was basically everything Monorail did, and it, and it did a lot. It did most of our things. It was an API server. It hosted assets, it was sending emails, it was just doing a lot of different things. Um, so all of every request at Airbnb to Airbnb.com, whether it was every public request was routed through Monorail. Um, so Monorail is a single point of failure. If we somehow couldn't deploy Monorail or there was a bug in Monorail and Monorail's down, 
that means Airbnb is down. If we break a Hyperloop, that means just a small set of Airbnb is down, just a small part of our front end is down, not the entire application. And Monorail being big as it is, it was also extremely hard to kind of deploy and debug that. It was just a beast. Um, so, you know, what does it look like with Hyperloop? Well, you can see that whole orange on the previous slide, that orange just became this little purple Hyperloop. Isn't it beautiful? Um, so you can have many smaller individual Hyperloops. Front-end developers love React, so we let them write React. Um, and, you know, every page in our single-page web app is, a, is an individual Hyperloop. We can even do neat things like use service workers, the new hotness, or, or many, many different things um, kind of using these individual Hyperloops. And the most beautiful thing about this is every Hyperloop can be deployed independently. If your team works on a single page, you can deploy your page while someone else is deploying a different page. Isn't that beautiful? No more merge queue. It's great. Developers love this. Um, so our, our kind of like front end view is we'll be moving towards many smaller Hyperloops. Uh, so here's the life of an HTTP request in Hyperloop without digging too much into this. Now uh, what happens is you, know, you hit a CDN. If you don't hit the CDN, we'll kind of server-side render the front end. And then uh, the Hyperloop will either talk to our microservices layer or it will still talk to, to Monorail. Uh, so this is kind of the life of just a single HTTP request at Airbnb on a very low level view. Um, so, you know, that's our vision for front end, and that's great. Um, but, you know, front end, that's not everything. That's maybe like half of your code base. What are, you, what are we going to do about the back end? Are we just going to keep Monorail alive as kind of like a back end server? No, we're not going to do that. We're moving to Treehouse. Uh, fun fact Treehouse, why did we pick the name Treehouse? Well, we write our microservices in Java. One of the most popular Airbnb listings and the highest rated Airbnb listing is the one in the background here. It's on the island of Java, and it's a treehouse, hence the name treehouse for our Java monorepo. Uh, so why do we choose Java? Well, you know, Java, it's really good performance, actually. The JVM has been going through optimization after optimization for like decades now, so it's kind of near C++ in performance, debatable, but you know, it's up there. And why do we love Java? Static typing. Um, you know, as much as we love Ruby, calling a method and then like passing in the wrong parameters and then kind of breaking something twen two weeks later, um, it's, it's just not it's just not great. Um, so we you know we catch these kind of things now using static typing in, in Java. Um, so you know, as of today, we have we actually have 724 microservices in Treehouse, and those microservices are owned by. 61 different teams, so you can see there are actually almost as much microservices as developers. We really want these services to be micro. We want them to do small things. We're building all these little microservices, and it's great. Uh, so here's what an HTTP request looks like for Treehouse, um, very similar to an HTTP request for Hyperloop, other than it gets routed to the appropriate microservice, um, kind of using SmartStack. SmartStack is our internal like service discovery system that Airbnb open sourced, and I believe it's also used at Pinterest. Um, and that's great. You know, our services they um, they talk to JSON, they talk to our uh, the Hyperloop using JSON, because you know JavaScript developers they love using consuming JSON, and that's great. But you know, inter-service communication in JSON, um, I would not recommend it. Uh, why? Well, you know, JSON is just kind of a loose, loose structure. Um, anyone can send anything. If you have hundreds of services communicating with each other, expecting some kind of JSON, and suddenly someone changes a service like three or four layers down, and you send a different, you send an array instead of an object, all hell will break loose. So we needed some kind of like static system uh, to communicate on the back end. Um, so we decided on Apache Drift uh, mainly because it's standardized, it's open sourced by Apache, and it comes with a schema validation. So you can write a schema. You can say, you know, a person has a first name and a last name. Those things are strings. If you give me something else, it won't work. Um, so we have a centralized repository with schemas inside of it, and then you know we communicate using Drift. Um, 
we also wrote our own Thrift compiler called Sparsam. We wrote it in C++. It compiles Thrift into binary, so we get really good performance. Rather than parsing Java objects into JSON and then back into Java objects, we just send the binary straight down the wire, and it's just much faster. Um, it allows us to do something called RPC, a pretty old concept, but it's a remote procedure call. You can call a local function as if it were local, but it's actually a different microservice. So you can just pull another service in as a library and just call functions on an object, but you're actually interacting over the network using Thrift. Um, so it's really cool. Um, another bonus of this is it allows you to uh, communicate across different languages. If someone has a Thrift um, client for Python, suddenly you can talk from Python to Java or from, and that's how our Node.js talks to microservices, it uses a Thrift uh, client for Node.js and then Thrift on Java. So internally, we communicate over Thrift. Externally, towards the client, we talk JSON over HTTP. Um, you know, we, we use Thrift, but you know, uh, most of our stuff is actually asynchronous. If you're dealing with a website like Airbnb, dealing with millions of requests, um, you need a better system. Uh, for anything that's asynchronous. Um, so we use a message queue. Uh, the concept of a message queue is actually really simple. There's just a giant queue and you put messages into it, hence a message queue. Um, and so for example, let's say that a user booked a listing and we want to send them an email confirming their booking. Well, what happens is the Hyperloop sends a request to Treehouse, which then just puts a message in the queue, a microservice, the booking confirmation service puts a message into the queue, and then the email service, which is uh, a worker, is kind of just listening for these kind of messages on the queue and just like handling message by message. We have like hundreds of workers kind of dealing with these messages. And so the great thing about this is it makes our system durable. If our email server is down, then we can just put messages on the queue, and then once our email service is back up, we can just kind of continue consuming or the other way around. Um, so it's just a durable system. We also have like a backlog of things happening. Um, how do we use this message queue? We use Jitney. Jitney is our internal version of Kafka. Kafka is like one of the more popular message queue systems that's built by LinkedIn. The cool thing is you can actually send a Thrift message down the queue and then asynchronously. So you can also use Thrift asynchronously and deal with the message like later rather than doing like synchronous communication. Uh, and that's great and all, but you know, we as developers, as, the, as dev infra, developer happiness, we need to build tools um, to allow engineers to um, kind of live in this new microservices world, which presents a whole slew of new challenges. Uh, so one of uh, the first things you need to take care of is service generation. If you have 724 microservices and counting, you don't want to deal with a lot of boilerplate. You don't want people to spin up their services. So for example, we have a tool called KubeGen, Kubernetes generation. You can create a new microservice within seconds. You just say, I want a microservice that has Ruby. And it sets up everything. It sets up logging, it gives you Thrift, it gives you testing frameworks, it gives you Airbnb logging, it gives you all the, you know, all the goodies that you expect from an Airbnb microservice. If we update our logging framework, we tell people like, hey, use KubeGen to do an update, and you'll have the latest tools at Airbnb to uh, deal with your microservice. Um, and another cool thing is you can use a Thrift schema to generate a, an API. If you have a schema for a person, then we know what that person looks like. So if you just have a Thrift schema, it'll automatically generate a REST API for you, so no more writing of REST APIs. It's all just inferred for you. You can spin up a REST API within seconds. How cool is that? Um, there's more. Uh, we have something called OneTouch. All of your configuration for your service lives in the repo of your service. Uh, so what does it mean? Uh, we have configuration as code. Like, for example, which test framework do I want to use? Um, which programming language am I using? Which version of Ruby am I using? How often does my uh, change, how often do I get deployed? Uh, what kind of containers do I want to use? All of that lives inside of the repository. So your configuration is kind of like tracked as source code. Um, and it's also extensible, like people can create a new testing framework and then you know they can say like, oh, if you do test type equals this, then you'll be using this new 
testing framework. So really, one touch is like you have a single, in a single touch, all of your configuration lives inside of your microservice. It's really like a small, self-sustainable service. Um, how do we deploy uh, these microservices? Well, our good friends at Google and, and Microsoft and many other companies recently open sourced something called Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is the helmsman. Uh, it basically, it's a container orchestration software. Um, so if you're familiar with a container, a container is just like kind of like an isolated, um, it basically allows you to run software in isolation on a virtual machine. Um, so we just tell people to um, put their stuff inside of a container, like an actual container in real life. And then we just deploy these microservices, these containers into our cluster. Um, so what, it, what does it allow you to do? It allows you to automatically scale, because now you can say, I want 20 containers. Oh, it's the holidays. It's a very busy season for Airbnb. We'll just multiply these containers. Now we have 500 containers. Oh, it's night. No, not a lot of people are booking. We can spin down these containers and, serve, and save a lot of money. Um, so we kind of deploy using Kubernetes. It's been great for us. It's one of our favorite tools. Um, how does it work? Well, it's, it's, it uses the concept of service orchestration. Um, it's kind of like an orchestra. All these services are kind of moved around on virtual machines, kind of like a Tetris. Um, you just say, like, I need this much memory. I need this much disk space. I need a beefy CPU. And then based on that profile that's configured inside of your application, Kubernetes kind of knows, like, oh, there's room on this server, there's room on this server. And it kind of reschedules these containers uh, onto the hardware. Uh, so the really cool thing is you don't have to think about hardware. You just say, I have a server, I have a microservice that needs 256 megabytes RAM, and give me 3,000, and please schedule them on the cluster. That's it. So you as a developer don't have to think about any of that anymore. Um, obviously, you need to test. Um, so how do you test microservices? It's a pretty interesting problem. Uh, we have something called test pipelines. Um, so rather than next, we now have like even more steps that you kind of have to go through. Uh, obviously, we use the Thrift schema validation, which is kind of acting as a test of itself. And then we have something called Velute. Uh, Velute is our internal framework for browser testing. We basically run a bunch of virtual browsers that are constantly hitting Airbnb.com or next to the Airbnb.com, and they're going to the home page, and they're just making sure, clicking on a button, and they're making sure the right thing happens. They're like bots. Um, and so, as you can see here, we can kind of look at staging versus canary versus production and make sure everything looks great before we deploy into production. It gives our developers confidence. Uh, and last but not least, infrastructure as code, which is a really important concept now at Airbnb. Um, as I was saying earlier, Kubernetes kind of allows you to um, not think about hardware anymore. Um, even our infrastructure is now just a piece of configuration. It lives in your application's config. So you can say, I need an Nginx web server. I need a Redis. And you just put it in your pod. And that's it. There's no more like people manually like scripting stuff uh, and maintaining the hardware. We just say, hey, Amazon, please give us 5,000 virtual machines or 20,000 virtual machines. And then Kubernetes will take care of kind of scheduling everything on that. Um, so right now, it's still maintained by a team called Compute Infra. They're kind of maintaining those underlying machines. But you know, the future is bright. Uh, we'll be moving to Amazon EKS. At that point, Amazon just gives us Kubernetes, and we, we don't even think about hardware at all. We just think about containers and microservices. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the lessons that we've kind of learned from this journey, this really this trip uh, from like monorail to microservices, I would still say build a monolith first. Um, why? It's easy. You don't want to be dealing with a Kubernetes or hundreds of microservices if you're a team of five people. It just, it just doesn't scale well when you're small. Do monolith first. Make money first. Make sure your startup is actually viable before you start thinking about microservices. Um, should we have moved to microservices earlier? Sure. Am I angry at Nate for like doing Rails in it? 10 years ago, no. It allowed him to make money. It allowed him to get the company to where it's at. And that's what matters. Another lesson learned is automate, automate, automate. Just like Scram. Scram is great. and just detects errors for us. It's got like hundreds or thousands of errors. 
you don't want developers doing QA. You want to keep people happy, so just automate every little thing. You don't want people doing writing boilerplate code to spin up a service. You want to automate all of that. Another lesson is immutable infrastructure. Um, every server should be reproducible from just a simple, simple config file. You should just have a file that says, I need an Apache and Nginx and a Redis, and that's it. And if the server dies, we can make two new ones. Your infrastructure should be immutable. The only way to replace a server is to kill it and to make a new server. Um, another interesting concept is you know, SOA. People talk about microservices on the back end. We think about SOA on the front end. With Hyperloop, every individual page, every individual page is kind of this Node.js service that can render um, a page. And then, you know, last but not least, um, client communication. If you're talking to JavaScript, use JSON. Uh, Front-end developers love consuming JSON. If you're building an API, people love JSON. If you're doing inter-service communication, use schemas and use a message queue. Um, I think we have time for questions afterwards or now, Peter? What do you think? Take a few questions. Yeah, I can take a few questions. Any questions? All the way in the back there. Yes. Uh, let's say you're, uh, let's say you're pushing uh, like too many uh, comments at one shot to live. Yes. What if there are like quote unquote conflicts? Like if you're pushing so many at one shot, one batch, what if like uh, someone pushed something and then I push uh, something that's on the same page and there's like code conflicts? How do you handle it? That case? Right. So the way it, the way it works is um, things get merged into master first. And so, and then we deploy a batch of 20 changes that are already on the master branch. So they're already merged, so there cannot be any merge conflicts. Dealing with the second problem of like, you know, trying to figure out which one of those 20 PRs actually broke something is the exact reason why we are trying to get rid of Monorail. Uh, so uh, you mentioned about all benefits of Java, and you also mentioned about like, all uh, things you like about Ruby, yes? Yes. So I just want to understand, did you migrate to Java, or you still stay with Ruby? Uh, our plan is for backend services uh, to use Java. Um, we have a lot of tooling in Ruby. Um, so the two like big supported, the three languages at Airbnb right now are JavaScript, Ruby, and Java. Um, for high performance stuff, we prefer people use Java, but we have first class Ruby support at Airbnb. Uh, we use Sinatra, for example, for kind of API servers. So um, you mentioned like you're missing all these um, kind of features of, uh, from Ruby and Java, like, but um, we also have Scala and some Groovy. Like, did you consider them? Or you want pretty much go to Java only? Uh, we want to, so we're still, fairly, our infrastructure team is really busy moving to SOA right now. So we don't have the resources to support yet another programming language. Uh, so for now, we'll be sticking with Java and Ruby, um, but we're actually starting to use some Go. Um, and fun fact, Scala, um, some of uh, Scram, which was built during a hackathon, is actually using Scala, but it's our one Scala app at Airbnb. Yes. Hey, yeah, you spoke a lot about uh, splitting up the mono repo yes. and breaking that into uh, microservices and the infrastructure for doing that. Yes. But you didn't talk much about specifically the, uh, the well, actually, splitting up the, the mono application into a mono repo. The mono repo pattern, I think, is, is very common now for yes. front end components. But for microservices, that's kind of a newer, sort of interesting thing to do. Can you speak more about some of the pros and cons of that? Uh, so. You're talking about the Treehouse um, micro uh, the Treehouse Mono repo that houses all of our Java applications. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something interesting to be said about you know having like hundreds of smaller repos. Um, we didn't want to deal with um, kind of version dependencies between all of these microservices. Um, so you can just make a change across two microservices in a single commit. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. There are a lot of engineers at Airbnb that don't like a monorepo. There are a lot of engineers at Airbnb that do like a monorepo. Um, we decided we were going with Treehouse as a monorepo after weeks of debate. Um, 
which was very in-depth, but um, we slightly edged toward using a monorepo. Can you share maybe just some of the high points of uh, of the sure. Day. Some of the high points, um, we can build all of our tooling around this single, single repository. Um, and we, I mean, I think the biggest selling point for us is kind of the ability for us to kind of make changes across multiple services in a single, in a single go. So we have a system. Um, if you make a, if you make a change to the monorepo, we run a script and we detect kind of which apps of that monorepo that you've uh, actually impacted, and then you'll be deploying. Um, so it's, a, it's as if you had like hundreds of applications in a single repository. I think our main benefit is source control, um, if that answers your question. I also wasn't there making the decision uh, doing Treehouse. Um, so it's kind of been forced upon us. Great. Uh, let's hear a big round of applause for Jens. Thank you.